Martin Heidegger is considered the most important philosopher of the 20th century, if for no other reason than for his originality. His observations bring into view a blind spot in our understanding of our relationships in the world, unrecognized in some 2300 years of human history. He shows us a distinction also taken up by pragmatists in which the dualisms attached to our concepts of reality, reason, and nature are dissolved into the notion of a better human future. This post-Nietzschean branch of European philosophy and post-Darwinian philosophy includes Sartre, Gadamer, Derrida, and Foucault, and James, Dewey, Wine, Putnam, Davidson, and Richard Rorty. These thinkers are often described as anti-dualists. Taken together, they and Heidegger might say, the vocabulary in which the traditional problems of Western metaphysics are formulated were useful for a time, but are no longer. This move from the questions and vocabulary associated with appearance and reality to the more useful and less useful dissolves many of the traditional problems of epistemology and metaphysics. From this new point of view, these concerns with our mental representations adequately corresponding to the intrinsic nature of reality are false and dangerously false. Heidegger argues that we should replace the view that we humans are minds working with representations of the world with the idea that we are language users, using our best developed tools, words, to cope with our environments. This shift from the Cartesian changes our understanding of words as representational to thinking of words as nodes in a causal network binding us to our environments. This move from the representational to the causal is a central critique Heidegger puts forward. The Western tradition since Plato has held that to be is to be a substance and that substances have properties. This view leads to subjects and predicates and the predicate calculus. A table is a self-sufficient entity and has certain properties inhering in it. It is brown, hard, heavy, and these properties, color, hardness, and weight, are also self-sufficient. Heidegger sees this is not the case, rather, that things are not atomistic in this way, but holistic, where everything is influenced by and depends on and could not be what it is except for everything else. This conception of the problem of substances, Heidegger calls the present at hand, the way of being of substances. For the Western tradition, the study of being, ontology, the order of things, is structured in the form of the predicate calculus, a system in which everything can be described once you get all the stories about all the subject substances and all the stories about all the properties and how they are related. Heidegger shows us the move from dualism to holism requires a second way of being in the world to account for the relatedness and situatedness of things. He calls this the way of being of equipment, or the ready to hand. The way of being of equipment takes into account the place in the practices of a culture of things in which something in particular is related to all of the equipment and to the goals and the skills of people. A hammer, for instance, has an in order to, in order to hammer in nails. It has a towards which, a task towards putting boards together. Also, a final towards which, say, building a house for the sake of shelter, or being a carpenter, and so on. The way of being with equipment is what it is about equipment that makes it equipment, which is holism and relatedness with our practices and our skills. All of this goes into what it is to be a hammer, and the name for the whole system of equipment, Tiger Balls, ready to hand way of being. Switching back to pragmatists, their move to replace the view that we humans are minds working with representations of the world, with the idea that we are language users using words to cope with our environment, follows from Heidegger's primacy of practical activity. His observations about the failure of Cartesian substance ontology to deal adequately with the vast network of hammers, trains, leaves, and all sorts of equipment, which is so basic for what it is to have a world 
and to be a human being is the most important set of distinctions in philosophy since Plato. The idea of words as nodes in a causal network is illustrated by Heidegger's further extension of the being of equipment with his observation of the unready technique. For example, a hammer, some piece of equipment, may have some aspect we must cope with. It may be too heavy for this job, for me, with these nails, in this hand, in this particular situation. Unlike words, designating properties like heavy, brown, and so on, here we are designating the aspects of our moves to an optimal grip of a situation, as it is related to some aspect of our goals our skills, our piece of equipment, and so on. The unready to hand illustrates for us the pragmatist's view of the rel relativity of descriptions to purposes. Elements of language or mind penetrate so deep into reality that the Cartesian ontotheological tradition of seeing human inquiry as the mapping of something language independent is fatally compromised from the beginning. Both the words we use and our willingness to affirm certain sentences using those words and not others are the products of fantastically complex causal connections between humans and the rest of the universe. This brings us around to Heidegger's third way of being. First was the way of being of substances, the present at hand. Second was the way of being of equipment, the ready to hand and its counterpart, the unready to hand. Last, we come to the way of being of people, which Heidegger calls Dasein. Our way of being is a kind of activity. We are what we do. We are coping beings. We are, at our most basic, always experiencing the foreopening, foreclosing, foresitting of things. In the course of our lives, we are socialized into a world of significance and shared practices and skills reciprocating in a world of equipment. At various points, we take up certain practices and in so doing an identity with roles. We become mothers, carpenters, computer programmers, and so on. As we take up the practices of procreation and tile rearing, the skills of building a house, and so on. This way of being Dasein is the most basic experience of the situation in which directed activity is going on, skilling, coping, in order to do something for the sake of some future. We take up a hammer in order to drive a nail, in order to fix something, for the sake of being a carpenter or a homeowner, or a provider of shelter and so on. This realization of the primacy of practical activity for us and its pressing into the future topples the understanding of people as thinking substances, contemplating objects with a quasi-divine faculty reason in pursuit of truth. In so doing, this richer understanding of our being as the dynamic of the being of substances, equipment, and Dasein undermines what has been called the metaphysics of presence the search for a full presence beyond the reach of play, absolute beyond the reach of relativity. In a world of practical activity, something is what it is in its relations. A hammer only makes sense in a world with nails and wood and houses and carpenters and so on. No matter whether the equipment is a hammer or a gun or a belief or a statement, tool using is part of the interaction of the organism with its environment in its attempts to serve its transitory purposes and solve its transitory problems. Heidegger's break with the Cartesian tradition brings us into a new relation with our beliefs and desires as instances of our doings for the sake of. Beliefs and desires are no longer forces acting out within the Cartesian theater which is a person's consciousness. They are simply tools for coordinating our behavior with those of others. This is not to say that one can reduce mental states such as beliefs and desires 
to physiological or behavioral states, he is willing to say that there is no point in asking whether a belief represents reality, either mental reality or physical reality, accurately. That is, for pragmatists, not only a bad question, but the root of much wasted philosophical energy. The right question to ask is, for what purposes would it be useful to hold that belief? Another way of making this last point is to say that we pragmatists cannot make sense of the idea that we should pursue truth for its own sake. We cannot regard truth as a goal of inquiry. The purpose of inquiry is to achieve agreement among human beings about what to do to bring about consensus on the ends to be achieved and the means to be used to achieve those ends. Inquiry that does not achieve coordination of behavior is not inquiry, but simply word book. To argue for a certain theory about the microstructure of material bodies or about the proper balance of powers between branches of government is to argue about what we should do, how we should use the tools at our disposal in order to make technological or political progress. So, for, for pragmatists, there is no sharp break between natural science and social science, nor between social science and politics, nor between politics, philosophy, and literature. All areas of culture are parts of the same endeavor to make life better. There is no deep split between theory and practice, because on a pragmatist view, all so-called theory, which is not wordplay, is always already practice. To treat beliefs as not as representations, but as habits of action, and words not as representations, but as tools, is to make a point to ask, am I discovering or inventing, making or finding? There is no point in fighting up the organism's interaction with the environment in this way. Consider an example. We normally say that a bank account is a social construction rather than an object in the natural world, whereas a giraffe is an object in the natural world rather than a social construction. Bank accounts are made. Giraffes are found. Now the truth in this view is simply that if there had been no human beings, there would still have been giraffes, whereas there would have been no bank accounts. But this causal independence of giraffes from humans does not mean that giraffes are what they are apart from human needs and interests. On the contrary, we describe giraffes in the way that we do as giraffes because of our needs and interests. We speak a language which includes the word giraffe because it suits our purposes to do so. The same goes for words like organ, cell, atom, and so on. The names of the parts out of which giraffes are made up, so to speak. All the descriptions we give of things are descriptions suited to our purposes. No sense can be made, we pragmatists argue, of the claim that some of these descriptions pick out natural kinds, that they cut nature out of joints. The line between a giraffe and the surrounding air is clear enough if you are a human being interested in hunting for meat. But if you are a language using ant or amoeba, or a space voyager observing us from far above, that line is not so clear. And it is not clear that you would have, or need to have, a word for giraffe in your language. More generally, it is not clear that any of the millions of ways of describing the piece of space-time occupied by what we call a giraffe is any closer to the way things are in themselves than any of the others. Just as it seems pointless to ask whether a giraffe is really a collection of atoms, or really a collection of actual and possible sensations in human sense organs, or really something else, so the question, are we describing it as it really is, seems one we never need to ask. All we need to know is whether some competing description might be more useful for some of our purposes. The relativity of descriptions to purposes is the pragmatist's principal argument for his anti-representational view of knowledge. The view that inquiry aims at utility for us, rather than an accurate account of how things are in themselves. Because every belief we make must be formulated in some language or other, and because languages are not attempts to copy what is out there, but rather tools for dealing with what is out there, 
there is no way to divide off the contribution to our knowledge made by the object from the contribution to our knowledge made by our own subjectivity. Both the words we use and our willingness to affirm certain sentences using those words and not others are the products of fantastically complex causal connections between humans and the rest of the universe. There is no way to divide up this causal web of causal connections so as to compare the relative amount of subjectivity and of objectivity in a given belief. There is no way, as Wittgenstein has said, to come between language and its object, to divide the giraffe in itself from our ways of talking about giraffes. As Hilary Putnam, the leading contemporary pragmatist, has put it, elements of what we call language or mind penetrate so deeply into reality the very project of representing ourselves as being mappers of something language independent is fatally compromised from the start. Critics of Heidegger think that unless there is something absolute, something which shares God's implacable refusal to yield to human weakness, we have no reason to go on resisting evil. If evil is merely a lesser good, or if all moral choice is a compromise between conflicting goods, then they say there is no point in moral struggle. The lives of those who have died resisting injustice become pointless. But to us pragmatists, moral struggle is continuous with the struggle for existence, and no sharp break divides the unjust from the imprudent, the evil from the inexpedient. What matters for pragmatists is devising ways of diminishing human suffering and increasing human equality, increasing the ability of all human children to start life with an equal chance of happiness. This goal is not written into the stars and is no more an expression of what Kant called pure practical reason than it is the will of God. It is a goal worth dying for, but it does not require backup from supernatural forces. The pragmatist view of what opponents of pragmatism call firm moral principles is that such principles are aberrations of past practices, a way of summing up the habits of our ancestors we most admire. For example, Mill's greater happiness principle and Kant's categorical imperative are ways of reminding ourselves of certain social customs, those of certain parts of the Christian West, the culture which has been, at least in words if not in deeds, the most egalitarian than any other. The Christian doctrine that all members of species are brothers and sisters is the religious way of saying what Mill and Kant said in non-religious terms, that considerations of family, membership, sex, race, religious creed, and the like should not prevent us from trying to do unto others as we would have them do to us, should not prevent us from thinking of them as people like ourselves, deserving the respect which we ourselves hope to enjoy. But there are other firm moral principles than those which epitomize egalitarianism. One such principle is that dishonor brought to a one, woman of one's family must be paid for with blood. Another is that it would be better to have no son than to have one who is homosexual. Those of us who would like to put a stop to the blood feuds and the gay bashing produced by these firm moral principles call such principles prejudices rather than insights. It would be nice if philosophers could give us assurance that, that the principles we approve of, like Mill's and Kant's, are rational in a way that the principles of the blood revengers and the gay bashers are not. But to say that they are more rational is just another way of saying that they are more universalistic, that they treat the difference between women of one's own family and other women, and the difference between gays and straights as relatively insignificant. But it is not clear that failure to mention particular groups of people is a mark of rationality. To see this last point, consider the principle, Thou shalt not kill. This is admirably universal, but it is more or less rational. But is it more or less rational than the principle, Do not kill unless one is a soldier defending his or her country, or is preventing a murder, or is a state executioner, 
or a merciful practitioner of euthanasia. I've had, I have no idea whether it is more or less rational, and so do not find the term rational useful in this area. If I am told that a controversial action which I have taken has to be defended by being subsumed under a universal rational principle, I may be able to dream up such a principle to fit the occasion, but sometimes I may only be able to say, well, it seemed like the best thing to do at the time, all things considered. It is not clear that the latter defense is less rational than say, some universal sounding principle, which I have dreamt up ad hoc to justify my action. It is not clear that all the moral dilemmas to do with population control, the rationing of health care, and the like, should wait upon the formulation of principles for their solution. As we pragmatists see it, the idea that there must be such a legitimating principle lurking behind every right action amounts to the idea that there is something like a universal, supranational court of law before which we stand. We know that the best societies are those which are governed by laws rather than by the whim of tyrants or mobs. Without the rule of law, we say, human life is turned over to emotion and to violence. This makes us think that there must be a sort of invisible tribunal of reason administering laws which we all, somewhere deep down inside, recognize as binding upon us. Something like this was Kant's understanding of moral obligation. But once again, the Kantian picture of what human beings are like cannot be reconciled with history or with biology. Both teach us that the development of societies ruled by laws rather than by men was a slow, late, fragile, contingent evolutionary achievement.